Welcome back to Light the Fuse. And uh, we are celebrating today, fifth anniversary, a little movie Woo! called Rogue Nation. Oh, Woo! there he is. Oh, my God. The party has started. <laughs> that's that's those are my celebration sounds. Yeah, we we were there opening night, oh so long ago at the oh, Chinese yeah, at the theater. the Chinese theater. That was probably soon after they converted it to an IMAX, right? Yeah, I don't remember the theater being particularly full, but we we certainly filled up the room with our enthusiasm and our. I think it was energy. full. Yeah, it was opening night. Maybe I'm thinking about when I saw the walk there and. Uh, oh yeah, no, that wasn't there. full. Yeah. <laughs> I love Zemeckis, and there's some really cool sequences in that movie, but but those theaters were not full when that movie came out. <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, we obviously love this movie, um, and we are so excited to... We kind of, you know, we realized we probably should have saved Joe Kramer for this anniversary, but we were so excited to get his episodes up, we kind of jumped the gun there. And um, so we, we kind of we took a, a different approach, and we talked to Seth Graham Smith who was in the writer's room, the famous writer's room for Rogue Nation as they were developing ideas. And so we've got this amazing new take on the movie, which is just great. Yeah, I think uh, you're going to really love the stories he has to tell. And um, we, we get to talk to him about some other things, too, that we'll, we'll you know, like Beetlejuice 2 and, and Dark Shadows and, and some of the other work he's done. So we'll we'll uh, we'll come back and we'll after the interview, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll be back at the end. But before we go, I just wanted to remind everybody that this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon. Check out his podcast, My Favorite Album. Each week, Jeremy chats with a musician, songwriter, filmmaker, someone uh, about their favorite album of all time. And uh, it's a really cool show, so you should check it out. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by John B., who is just incredibly helpful and supportive, and uh, we really appreciate his contribution. And Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate for growing companies. So thank you to everybody who contributes in this way. It really helps, and it keeps us on the air. So thanks a lot. And we will be back after Kevin Blumenfeld's, I mean, just straight up plagiarism of the plot. Uh, <laughs> but we'll be back. <laughs> So, so Seth, can you just talk about like how you initially got involved in this project? Because you were part of the writers' room for Rogue Nation, but how did you sort of get recruited for this? Um, I was friends with Liz Raposo, and she was the exec who uh, was covering the Mission movies for Paramount. And we had been working on some other things together, and she thought that I would be a good fit for the room, and and I guess pitched me to either Chris or JJ or somebody, but you know, I ended up in the room. One day I was uh, not <laughs> a part of the mission universe. And the next day I was in a room at Bad Robot spending one of two days in my complete two day involvement in the mission universe. <laughs> <laughs> Did you love the other movies? Did you like come in with an idea or something? Or was it just like, oh, this guy would work well? No, I mean, I didn't pitch uh, anything mission related, I guess. I, I think that is thought, I forget if I was working on something related at the time or not, but I had done other rooms for Paramount, like these big action rooms. Like I did one of the Transformers. I did a, uh, I think the first Turtles, I was in that room. And so, you know, the people at Paramount, some of the executives there uh, were familiar enough with me to suggest me for the room when it came up for Rogue Nation. Okay. Well, for, for people that don't know, what people hear about writer's rooms for TV shows, which seem to make a little bit more sense, but what, what is a writer's room for a movie like, typically? Every writer's room is different on every movie. I think that, you know, sometimes it's as few as two or three people with the director. Sometimes it's a huge conference room full of people uh, and, you know, executives and other key uh, crew and sometimes actors. I mean, it can be a, a lot of different things. For this, it was, I remember, I, I again, I have a very bad memory, but I did look over some production notes. So I hopefully am remembering all these things right. I remember, I think it was me, Drew Pierce, McQuarrie, JJ uh, popping in and out 
because he was editing Force Awakens at the time. I think that's right. And then maybe Chris Yost, if I'm, and if I'm misremembering that, I also did a Trek room in the same room a different year at Bad Robot. So I might be <laughs> like conflating some of these, um, these <laughs> memories. And then I also well, remember- Corey also said that uh, Drew Goddard was there as well. Was he there oh, right. you in that Okay, room? Drew Goddard. So I thought Drew was in the, the Star Trek room, but now you can see. So take nothing I say on this podcast at face value, <laughs> clearly. Uh, but, um, but I remember, yes, I remember Drew. And, and, and then I remember Simon Pegg dialing in on speakerphone from London, oh. wow. uh, where it was very late and- I think that he wasn't on the whole time, but he did pop in and out um, because, you know, obviously he's a writer as well and, and a brilliant guy with lots of cool ideas and knows that that franchise extremely well. So that was give or take the, uh, the room as I remember it. And, you know, in this case, it, it just felt very uh, informal. I think, I don't remember if we had read the script or not, but I remember we were told to sort of come in and bring pitches for sequences. And I remember specifically what the sequences that I pitched. And it was, I, I'd had this idea ever since seeing one of those gravity, uh, anti-gravity training planes that they use with astronauts where they fly on those, you know, big parabolic arcs and like you get 30 seconds of weightlessness in a, in a plane. You know, you, you've seen the videos yeah. online. And I was so proud of myself uh, and I, I, I came in there like so high on myself, like this is going to, this is, I know this is going to land. I know they're going to love this. And it was, you know, <laughs> they're on a, a plane, you know, a commercial plane that's not designed for that. And it gets somehow taken over by the bad guy. And Tom Cruise has to fight a bad guy while being weightless for 30 seconds at a time. And I thought, oh shit, that's going to be so cool. And the minute I pitched it, like, no, 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 we, we have a plane thing already. We're, we, don't worry. We got it worked out. And it was, of course, you know, the, the opening of the movie with, uh, with Tom grabbing onto the side of that Airbus uh, transport plane. Um, and then the other day, I'm looking online and I see that Tom Cruise is partnering with NASA and SpaceX to film a movie in space. And I'm like, well, that's my problem. I just didn't pitch big enough. Like <laughs> the weightlessness, that's one thing, but you know, you gotta, you gotta hand it to Cruz. He's always going to go bigger than, than you were thinking. So but I, that's what I remember about, about that room in terms of specifics. I also remember it was my first time spending time with McQuarrie. And I remember being really struck by him, like, really on my heels intimidated by him because he's the loveliest guy and so a foot and a half smarter than than I could ever be about structure and uh, about process and just about the world in general. He's such an intelligent guy that you, you're on your toes the whole time, like, or at least I was. I was really trying to uh, to impress him and and I remember sitting with him at lunch, you know, Bad Robot, at least they did five or six years ago, you know, they would have this catered lunch every day. So they would have a seating area with these nice tables and a nice kitchen and chefs and like the bell would ring and you'd come out of the room and they'd serve you this wonderful lunch and you'd sit down and, you know, you'd eat with, you know, the people that you'd been in the room with. And I remember like, I don't know if I like jockeyed people out of the way or if I just like hurried up and got my tray really quick so I could have a seat at McQuarrie's table just because <laughs> I wanted so desperately to like have two seconds to shoot the shit with him because, you know, I was already obviously sort of enamored of, of his writing before I had even met him. But, you know, halfway into the first day, I was I was like, this guy is just amazing. He's like, I want him to be my guru and, you know, I want to, you know, just like <laughs> kneel at his feet and learn from him. And, and so, and he, by the way, he could not have been nicer. Uh, now that you've reminded me that Drew Goddard was in the room, I remember, I think he was working on Daredevil at the time and like Drew could not have been nicer and Drew Pierce could not have been nicer and, and JJ. And like, it was just like a bunch of really nice um, genre dudes sitting around and, and let's, shine a light on that all dudes 
Um, right. <laughs> maybe not like, you know, the, the proudest moment for, uh, for diversity back in 2014. Uh, but I'd had a great time and I think it was one or two days. I can't remember, but I just remember a lot of, you know, pitching and um, pitching sequences. And I do remember Macquarie talking about the opera specifically. I remember that he already had that uh, sequence in his mind. And I remember that he, he referenced Hitchcock a lot in talking about that sequence. Um, which, you know, of course, to me, it was like, oh, my God, Hitchcock, he's so smart. <laughs> you know, it's like, thinking about, <laughs> you know, but I mean, like he's, you know, he he's he's well versed in those things. Uh, and, and I've seen I've seen me some Hitchcock movies, but like that guy can sit there and talk to you about like shots in Hitchcock movies and specific, you know, looks that specific actors give. him. Mean, he's just so incredibly uh, cinematically uh, fluent. And so it was a great one or two uh, days there. And I left having had like a, a, a really cool experience and hoping that somehow, you know, I had contributed something subconsciously that would somehow filter onto the screen. Uh, and then I, I, again, my memory is so bad. So, you know, take none of this as gospel, but I remember it was maybe a week later, I got a call from Paramount saying, uh, Chris wants to talk to you on the phone. And I mean, yes, of course, you know, <laughs> anytime. Uh, and it must have been a little while later because he was in London. And he he basically, uh, he had, he had I, I guess we had gotten on well in the room. And he's like, look, you know, if it's cool, like I want to call you uh, here and there and just run stuff up the flagpole and see what you think. Cause I'm experimenting with, you know, this action piece and this, you know, and I mean, that was, you know, unbelievably thrilling. And I remember sitting in my home office late at night because he was in London. So, you know, I think he was talking to me like at eight in the morning and it was midnight in LA. So, uh, but I remember the times being really weird. And I just remember basically being on a few phone calls with Chris intermittently while he was writing in London uh, and prepping the movie and him just talking me through the sequences that he had in his mind. And I mean, a, a testament to how smart he is. I basically just listened for him for like 45 minutes, talk about a sequence. And then finally you get to like, so what do you think? And I'd be like, that sounds unbelievable. I mean, like, I have nothing, I have nothing to contribute to that that would make that even remotely better. Um, so I, I think like, I, I think my Mission Impossible experience boils down to, I got a front row seat for a few sessions of watching one of the best writers and directors working do his thing, watch his process. And, and give him positive feedback. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and, and the cool thing about it is, I guess that was six years ago. If it, yeah, it was six years ago, that room. And we've stayed in touch since. We've, you know, we've talked about collaborating on things that, you know, how it goes. Like you talk and things come and go and they don't come to fruition. But we've stayed in touch pretty consistently. And he has been extremely generous with, his time, if I've had a, a question for him, just to shoot him an email or something, uh, as busy as he is, he, he, he's been really supportive and, and really generous. And, you know, I, I just don't have enough superlatives for the guy. So, you know, I'm so excited. By the way, I, uh, I loved, uh, I guess we're calling it six. Do we call it six? Or do we, you know, I don't know. Fallout? Fallout. Fallout. Uh, yeah, we call it Fallout. I don't know if you guys call it Six or Fallout. You know, <laughs> I call it Six. I mean, I loved Fallout. I'm so excited for the next two movies. I mean, like, I can't think of many franchises that just consistently get better as they go on and on and on. And, like, don't get me wrong. I love so much of the De Palma movie. You know, there are things that I will uh, defend and love about the John Woo movie. You know, I love the JJ movie, like I think, and Brad Bird's movie. And like, I think they all have, you know, some extraordinary uh, sequences. And I think that, 
I don't, I wouldn't say any of them is a bad movie, although people like to rag on two, I get it, you know, but I think like this series, unlike any other series I can think of, is sort of like come of age in a weird way. As its protagonist has gotten older, the movies have gotten better. And that's strange. I can't really think of, of you know, many franchises that, that age that well and continue to, uh, you know, to resonate with audiences. So, but I mean, I think the, the, the message I'm trying to get across here is I had nothing to do with why <laughs> Rogue Nation was good whatsoever. But well, I, I am so uh, grateful for the opportunity to get to meet McCory and, you know, and then subsequently I got to meet Cruz and that was like unbelievable and just like, exactly what you hope meeting Tom Cruise is like. And, and what and was that, that? What happened there? How did you meet him? That, well, guys, I've met him twice. I just want to say, <laughs> so the, the first time was in, it was at the Star Trek into darkness premiere. And so I was a, a guest of uh, my friend, uh, Liz Raposo, uh, who is now, then was a, a, a vice president, and now was the president of Paramount Pictures. And we were in some like little cocktail private area before the screening. And there's McCory talking to Cruz and Raposo says, come on over, I'll introduce you to Tom. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, like just absolutely shitting myself. And, you know, just one of those incredible moments where you're high-fiving your 13-year-old self as you, you know, as you sort of dream walk over to Tom Cruise. And like, you know, you've heard so many people describe him this way. And I I had heard people describe him this way before I met him. You, He makes you feel like you are the only person in the world when he's talking to you. He completely locks in. He wants to know about you. He asks you sincere questions. He gives you like thoughtful answers like you know and and yes like the guy drips intensity i mean he's just like i have never met somebody who is just like that locked in in his life <laughs> it's it's really also it's it's just as intimidating as macquarie's big brain it's like so you know i i think w it's so interesting to me that the two of them have had this you know this incredibly fruitful collaborative relationship over many movies you know not just the mission movies but over um, Valkyrie, uh, I think that's kind of where their relationship started. If if um yeah, and then um, Edge of Tomorrow and the Mission movies, and now Top Gun. Like, you know, Tom just trusts Macquarie implicitly, and you understand why. You know, and I don't know. I mean, I've I've never met a more movie star, movie star in my life. Like the guy just radiates movie star, and I think obviously growing up on his movies and, and just, you know, being a fan as long as we all have has something to do with it. But like, there's something to his persona that is just undefinable. And so, yeah, I mean, I remember having a conversation. I think that I, we were about to shoot or had shot, or it, it was around the time we were making it, uh, the first movie. And so we got into a conversation with uh, Tom and McQuarrie about Stephen King. And Tom revealed that while they were shooting The Outsiders, he and some of the other guys had visited the set of Maximum Overdrive because I guess that they were shooting near each other or near enough to each other. And so I knew because, you know, I'm like Stephen King geek, like I knew the anecdotes about shooting Maximum Overdrive, one of which was just how completely smashed most of the people were on set, like making that movie, like that's around, that's, a, that's kind of around Stephen King's, and he'll admit this, like his blackout period of just, you know, drugs and booze. And, and so for whatever reason, I said, oh man, that must've been really interesting because I've heard that like, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on in that set. And he looks at me, Tom Cruise looks at me and goes, what do you mean? And so instantly I like, I die because <laughs> I, 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 you know, I instantly regret having opened my mouth. Um, and I said, well, you know, like, you know, King's talked about, you know, the drugs on set and he goes, I mean, he looks me right in the eye and he goes, people don't do those things around me. 
like, oh my god! <laughs> and you realize, like, and and it, it would just with the such calm certainty that you know this just the absolute quiet muscle behind that statement, and you're like, god damn right they don't. I mean, I I wouldn't put a <laughs> a, a, a toe out of line, uh, but but then you remember. <laughs> You're talking about 1982, 83 Tom Cruise, right? Like who, who, like I, I mean, had been in like what? What had he been in at that point? Other than I mean, The Outsiders was like I think what, that taps? might be his first. Yeah, maybe one of his maybe first taps. Yeah, but like wow, uh, just you know, you, it makes you realize the guy was already just a force of nature when he was a kid. So that's that's my um, and then the second time was running into McQuarrie, who was with Tom in one of the hallways at the Warner Brothers executive building. I, I don't know what they were there for. They're, maybe it was there for Edge of Tomorrow, but I ran into Tom again and couldn't have been nicer, but you know, it was just one of those things in passing. But it does count as a meet, so therefore I'm sticking by my two times meeting Tom Cruise story. Wow. <laughs> well, when you got into the writer's room, was the Drew Pierce draft already done or was that what you guys were working off of what what did what was that about yeah i think it was i think that there had been i i, I don't know if there had been drafts before drews i can't say but i know drew had written a draft uh and i know mccory knew that he was going to do some writing on it i mean you know that's kind of why we were all there i don't i can't remember whether the plan was for them to write it together or to have drew write a draft or if chris was just going to do it i don't I can't really speak to any of that, but I remember Drew, you know, being there and, and, and being very involved in, and, and, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we were discussing his work and I mean, Drew's a great writer. I love Drew and, and he's a, you know, he's a friend and, and has always been uh, extremely cool. Uh, I don't know what his mission, uh, his mission story is. You'd have to, yeah. you'd have to ask Drew, but yeah. Yeah. No, I remember, having a great time being there with him for a very limited amount of time. Were you, um, were you guys kicking around the, um, cause I, I don't know if it was in the Drew Pierce draft or if it came out of your writer's room, but there was a version that there was an early version of rogue nation where the movie opened in the past, like in the 1960s with some kind of sequence that connected to some old IMF team or something. Were you a part of that at all? Yeah, I remember that. I remember, um, we were talking and okay. So now you just jog my memory. I also remember one of the things that I that I discussed on the phone with McQuarrie when he would call me and tell me great ideas and I would just nod my head and say great great job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the one of the things that we had been kicking around and I think it may have been in Drew's draft and I think you're right about this was the idea that there was like an elder Ethan Hunt, right, who was from a different time period, a different kind of IMF agent, you know, but like kind of dinosaured out of the business and is now, you know, sitting there um, in retirement and then gets brought back in. I, I do remember there being talk of Ethan having to deal with um, almost like a new kind of John Voight, you know, mentor character and how fun it would be to fall in love with this guy and then have the guy be, you know, typical mission style, be the double crosser, but then maybe triple crossing back. Like he's never left. I am a, you know, all those things. And I remember, and maybe I'm, no, I do. I remember there being like discussions about what the sixties IMF gear would have been like and, and how, you know, it would have been fun to sort of play with some of the things that the show played with in terms of technology. But uh, I don't remember too much more than that, but yeah, there was a discussion about different time periods for sure, and and I couldn't That's tell awesome. you, I couldn't tell you what, where it it just dropped out of the process, but I also remember talking about, I I remember McCory talking a lot about the opera, like he was totally dialed in on that opera sequence, like I mean I think he just completely knew every shot of it before they before they went in, and how Hitchcockian he wanted it to be, and and. And the results speak for themselves. I mean, that sequence is unbelievable. But I do remember talking about the time period. And I can't remember whether or not he was, you know, debating the merits of it at that point or not. But I remember it coming up. And that uh, the um, McCory has mentioned, I think, before that, that at one point, the character from the, the main character from the 
uh, from the original TV show, from the first season of the original TV show, was Dan Briggs. Do you know, was that the older Stateman IMF character? Was it, was it Dan Briggs? I can't, I can't recall. I don't know. And, um, and I remember it was, okay, so you guys know this. So you guys tell me, was Rogue Nation Alec Baldwin's first mission? Yes. All right. Yeah. So that validates a weird memory that I have of, you know, like I have a few phone calls with Chris and then like months go by and, you know, he's been off writing and scouting and, and pre-visiting. And, and then I read that Alec Baldwin has been cast in the next mission movie. And I remember thinking like, oh, that's so cool. I wonder if that's going to be that older mentor character. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, you know, if you want to like spark a little fan theory, maybe, maybe, and you obviously you'd have to ask Chris about this, like maybe that character morphed into the character that um, Alec ultimately played. Wow. Right. You got to get that. We got to get him on the show. You got to get Alec. Yeah. Got to get him. (laughs) Do you remember anything else that came out of that writer's room that you ended up seeing in the movie, however many months later? I mean, the two big ones are honestly at the beginning of the movie. They are the plane and the opera. And and those were, you know, those were really the the main things. I mean, I had no concept of like how cool Rebecca Ferguson and all the motorcycle stuff was going to be. And, you know, I mean, when I went and saw the movie, it was like, it was such an incredible surprise because it was fun. It was like watching a, a it was watching something that you just, you, you knew what the sort of contours were. Like you could see the outside of the building, but then obviously like you went inside and you're like, oh my God, this is so much cooler inside. So, <laughs> you know, I, again, cannot say enough about the Cruz Macquarie uh, tandem. It's like, it's just, it's unbelievable. I want them to do 10 more movies together. I think they've done think 13 they together at this point. So I'm sure 10, <laughs> 10 is... Tens achievable. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I, you know, I want to ask you about a lot of things in your career. So, but the, I think to make sure that I don't lose time and not ask about this, I want to make sure because I, 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 I grew up as a huge Tim Burton fan. So, you know, the, it's long talked about you writing a Beetlejuice sequel. Is that right? You, I assume you've written a script for it. Is that ever going to happen, or what's what's happening with that? Boy, I you know, um, let me get my crystal ball. I think like. Uh, I wrote a script. So, you know, uh, I met Tim in 2009. I know that because I met Tim the same day Michael Jackson died. So I'll always know the exact time (laughs) and place that I met him. And that was when he had purchased the rights to my book, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and he was going to produce it. And so we were meeting and he was on the Culver City Studios lot finishing Alice in Wonderland, doing some BSVAC stuff. And so we worked together for the next two and a half years on uh, Lincoln and uh, and on Dark Shadows. And during the Dark Shadows shoot in London, I remember I remember having discussions with him about it. So you're talking 2011. This is nine years ago. And I came back to the States and my producing partner, David Katzenberg, and I went over to David Geffen's house one day. And which was bizarre. It used to be Jack Warner's estate and is now Jeff Bezos's estate. But we went down into some like sitting room in the basement and basically said, because, you know, Geffen controls the rights for, for Beetlejuice and said, look, if we can get Tim to be interested in it, would you let us develop a, a Beetlejuice sequel? And what does he care? He says, sure, whatever. Good luck. You know, and <laughs> and so. I wrote a script, I want to say, eight years ago and have rewritten it a few times since. And, you know, it's it's one of those things that comes up every once in a while. But, like, ultimately, it's not about an idea that I have for Beetlejuice. It's not about how much I want to see Michael Keaton put the, the makeup on again. It's really ultimately going to come down to if Tim has an inspiration for it, if Tim, if Tim feels it's the right time for him to do it and, like, I'm not going to be the guy to try to pressure Tim Burton to do anything. I want him to, you know, go on his own path, be his own artist, you know, surprise us like he does. And, you know, look, someday, maybe before, you know, I mean, Keaton would look exactly the same with the makeup on right now. Uh, and he certainly, you know, has the energy to do that role. And, <laughs> and it would be incredible to see him again. But like, it has to, it has to happen 
I hate this word guys organically. Um, but it's true. <laughs> it like, you know, you, you, you can't force it. So, uh, I don't know. I think right now I would say very, I would say a very outside chance. Right. But it's okay. Not every movie needs to be revisited. Yeah. It was, there were a few years ago where it seemed like both Keaton and Burton were interested in it. It seemed like it might happen. Do, do you, um, I remember Burton years and years ago had talked about some kind of Beetlejuice in Hawaii idea. Was it that, or was it something completely different? No, it was totally different. That was the Beetlejuice in Hawaii. Was this, it was a script they developed right after the, uh, the first movie. Right. And I think they abandoned it pretty quickly. Although like what I hear, I've never read it. I can't get my hands on it. But what, but what I, what I heard about it was that it was basically like beach blanket bingo, like one of those Frankie yeah. and Annette movies, only like Beetlejuice was like the star surfer of the beat. It was just so weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> Beetlejuice goes oh to Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beetlejuice surfing. So I don't know. It won't be that, but you know, if I if, assume there's nothing you can tell us about the story for it. Yeah, I'd rather not. I think we landed on a good story for it. I think the, 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 the problem is that so much of the genius of Beetlejuice comes from the looseness uh, and the and this sort of, you know, just the onset instincts that happen between Tim and Michael Keaton. And I think so much of that movie is just, you know, Tim having instincts and Keaton having instincts and like, as a writer, it's a really scary because you, you can sort of do your best to approximate the Beetlejuice voice, but you're never going to write Beetlejuice as well as Keaton lives Beetlejuice on the, on the day, in the moment. So I, I think like I would almost tear the script up and, and rather just see them like improvise a movie. That would be exciting to me. But, you know, <laughs> no one's going to no one's going to hand you a, a zillion dollars to go and make that. So I guess we'll have to wait. <laughs> um. I wanted to talk about Dark Shadows because I think Drew and I are both big fans of that movie. It's it, I feel like it's oh, a you're the two. Underrated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I feel like it's I mean I've I've revisited it a couple of times in the last few years and it's just really weird and I love it's how weird. weird it is. Like it feels it feels more like it fits in with some of his earlier movies, but but with the like really polished beauty of the later ones. Yeah. Um, and it's a really interesting, really interesting movie. I didn't know if you, if you had any stories or anything you want you could share about the process of making that movie. Well, I mean that was the second movie I'd ever been paid to write. And it was this gigantic, you know, you remember like Tim was coming up, Tim and Johnny were coming off of Alice. And the, it was just, they could, they had a blank check to do whatever they wanted. And what they wanted to do was make this weird sort of, you know, chamber piece, uh, like this, this, this bizarre little, you know, study of, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you can't even describe it, but like, I remember the, the word chamber piece being used a lot. And so, I mean, for me, Dark Shadows is a very happy memory for a lot of reasons, because I was still pretty new in 2010 when I started that process and getting to sit there in Johnny Depp's dining room in London in the middle of the night uh, drinking wine and talking about, you know, Barnabas Collins while he's still got his pirates makeup on. Cause he had just come home from shooting. Like <laughs> I, there was a point where I found myself, it, it, you know, three in the morning in London, I'm totally jet lagged. I'm there for like one day just to meet with Tim and Johnny and then go back and start writing. And we're sitting there and we're drinking wine and we're laughing and, you know, Johnny's rolling cigarettes and like, he's just such a interesting, charming guy. Johnny is such a, you know, he's such a great conversationalist and storyteller. And so, you know, you just, you'd start talking about the script and then you'd veer off into uh, whatever you can only imagine, you know, the subjects. But I had to pinch myself at one point because I had to, I had to physically tell myself, get outside your body right now and appreciate this moment. Because I, <laughs> I can distinctly remember being 13 years old, maybe 14 and my mom dropping me off uh, at the Cine Theater in, uh, in Danbury, Connecticut, by myself to see Edward Scissorhands in 1990. And I went in and watched the movie and was completely just blown out the back of the theater, transported, inspired. And I came out and I remember my mom was late picking me up and I'm standing there in an almost empty parking lot 
total darkness and it starts to snow. And it was like this incredible moment of, well, I just saw that, <laughs> that magical <laughs> snow. And, you know, it was almost like Edward was talking to me. And so I had to take myself out of the moment and say, 20 years later, you're sitting here with those two guys collaborating. And that's incredible. And even if, you know, your, your career completely implodes and you never amount to shit and <laughs> you have this, cling to this, this will be the story you tell um, at the bar when they're trying to kick you out, you know? <laughs> and so, and then also like getting to work with Richard Zanuck, um, legendary producer. I mean, that cast just like unbelievable. Bruno, the DP, like shooting a movie that looks, you know, every frame is like a painting in that movie. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Just walking around Pinewood. I mean, you, you, you yeah, look but, at that movie. So you were there on set? Like, did you see Rick Heinrichs's pier, the set that he did for the pier? Oh, did I see it? I have, I have pictures walking around that set. Like, I mean, so what was crazy about that is I, I was there a lot. And I remember when they started building it, it was just a bunch of scaffolding. And, you know, so Pinewood has this gigantic uh, wave tank with this gigantic, like 300 foot green screen. And the wave tank is, you know, it's raised up off the ground. And so if that's going to be your ocean, then your, your town needs to be even higher than that. So that <laughs> whole thing that you're seeing in the movie, the whole town, and by the way, they built the whole town. It's so incredible. Down to like the napkins on the tables in the diner that you never go into in the movie had the diner's logo on them. Like, wow, the whole, it was a real town. You would not know the difference, but it was 16 feet in the air over the English <laughs> countryside on scaffolding. <laughs> it was incredible that they built that practically. You would never in a million years, 10 years later, build that practically now, never. Yeah, but it's like the end of an era. That It, it, it really was. And, and Rick Heinrich sets, like you'd walk around in the manor, right? Like when you walk in the, the grand staircase, you could turn around 360 degrees and look up at a ceiling that was 30 some odd feet over your head. And you could just inspect that set down to the smallest detail of the carvings over the mantles. And it was just exquisite, just unbelievable. And I don't think I'll ever have, you know, even if I make movies for another 40 years, I don't think I'll ever have an experience like that again because it would never make sense to build like that now. But I'm so grateful that that I had that experience. And the people I met on that, uh, many of them I'm still friends with. Uh, so that's a very, very happy memory. And obviously, I wish the movie had worked better, but it has its fans. It's a weird, weird movie. And like it's on one, on one hand, it's this gigantic spectacle. And on the other hand, it's like this unapologetically morose. <laughs> bizarre tonally inconsistent you know, like, <laughs> uh train ride uh, about the train wreck of a family but i just i love i i love i love uh johnny's performance in that movie and i love helena's performance in that movie oh my god i mean yeah. she I, she steals every scene she's in and chloe and and i mean they're all just they're they're all magnificent well you're a vampire guy did you get to talk to christopher lee on the set so I was there when they shot the bar scene with him and I did not get to talk to him. I don't remember because I, re I would have remembered. But here's what I also remember. While he was at Pinewood, I remember he, he was also doing, and maybe I'm not even supposed to say this, but I don't care because, you know, he's dead now. He was also doing pickups for Lord of the Rings because I remember like spying through an open stage door as he was standing in a partial foreground set in a gigantic green screen wearing his robes. And, and I was like, holy shit. I mean, how incredible is this to, to see him? But I mean, he was, he was old. I mean, yeah. Was, you know, I mean, he was in his 90s, I think, or, or close to it. So, you know, the fact that I got to write dialogue for Christopher Lee, I mean, that's like one of the Dark Shadows happy memories that I'll always have. Yeah, it's an amazing little performance. We have a couple of huge questions that we ask every guest on on this show, and I hope you've I hope you've done your homework. <laughs> the first question. I assure you, I haven't. Your hair looks great as 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 a quarantine. Someone in quarantine, your hair looks really good. I don't know who cut your hair or if you did it yourself, but we want you to rank Tom Cruise's hairstyles in the Mission Impossible series from your favorite to least favorite, or whatever you yeah. want. All right. 
I know two is going to be the last. I get it. You know, so you're not a long hair guy. <laughs> I'm not a long hair Tom guy. The only time I've liked Tom with long hair is interview with the vampire. And that was a wig. And so <laughs> uh, I, I admit it. Well, actually, no, two times that and Magnolia. I like Tom with long hair. Yeah. Okay. But um, I would say, you know, almost work your way backwards and then and then just switch. Yeah, just flip one and two because in one, it's a little short for me. Yeah. You know? Okay. It's a little buzzy. It's a little buzzy for me in one. But I like how it's sort of settled in. Okay. So you're more of a short. So mm-hmm. your least favorite short. are like two and four? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. Well, we, we like the short hair. We like the one in, the, in one because it feels like maybe he's just out of the military. You know, he's a young. It does feel, yeah. But he's letting yeah. it grow in. Yeah. <laughs> And but that was also, also like, that was also 24 years ago. Yes. <laughs> we tried to get McCoy to tell us where his hair was at right now, but he yeah. you know, he resisted. So again, <laughs> you're you rank the movies for us if you could from maybe okay. your least favorite to favorite. All right. Well, I'm going to be selfish and say even though I had nothing to do with it, but since I was in the room, I'm going to say number 1. <laughs> uh, number 1 is Rogue Nation. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll say um, number two is one. Okay. Number three is Fallout. Okay. Controversial. Number four is four. Okay. Number five is three. Sorry, JJ. Even though, by the way, Philip Seymour Hoffman, crazy good. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and and uh, number six would be two. Okay. That's a yeah. pretty. That's that's a solid list. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, nothing. I hope too like. Not too controversial. Er, heretical. No, no, no. Okay. All right. Good. If uh, if Macquarie called you tomorrow and said I need help on this these next two, would you be there in an instant? Whatever you could do. I mean, obviously yes, but the thing about Macquarie is I don't think he needs my help, <laughs> and I got to discover that like firsthand. But yeah, I mean, like if Macquarie wanted to talk about old movies if Macquarie wanted to talk about anything like I just you know the guy is so interesting and um and so smart so yeah I mean obviously it would be a thrill to uh to to be in the process again of course awesome before you go um is there anything you can tell us about the the new Gremlins movie so we are not involved in Gremlins anymore yeah we get that a lot unfortunately oh, no. we had our moment on Gremlins there was a whole moment around it but um yeah, I don't know what's going on with Gremlins. Do you have a Do you have a, a pitch on it that you can you can share with us what what you were going to do with it? See, I don't know like who owns what, so I can't really say. Well, there's an but, animated oh, show okay. that's going to be on HBO Max. I'm excited about that. Yeah, so that could be cool. It's like a pre. Very excited. Yeah, I'm always excited for anything Chris Columbus, Joe Dante, Steven Spielberg, Joe Johnston, who you you name it. I told my friends that uh, at Disney Plus that you were coming on the show and that I would plug your uh, eight, your Disney Plus series that's coming soon. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, we're, we're just putting the writer's room together now, so it's very early. But yeah, we're doing an eight-part anthology series, sort of in the vein of like Amazing Stories or Twilight Zone, but, but definitely for a family audience, like starring young protagonists in their own spooky R.L. Stein situations. But it's a little older skewing, I think, than the... The goosebumps. That's awesome. Are I, you know just beyond is definitely for an older crowd, but I, yeah, I mean, super excited to be able to make a a a, a, a horror ish um, anthology <laughs> for Disney. I don't want to say horror because I don't want to make Disney Plus nervous because you know it's going to be Disney. <laughs> it's going to be fine. But yeah, we're just getting started. But I'm super excited about that. Awesome. Well, Seth, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a huge thrill to get to talk to you, and I know you were. You were uh, nervous that you wouldn't have great stories to tell, and obviously we put those fears to rest. So thank you so much. I hope so. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Welcome back. We're done with Seth Graham Smith. Not done. He's he's just you know he's got other things to do. He doesn't he doesn't have time to put up with us. But it was great to chat with him. He was what a cool guy and what a guy that's worked on so many interesting projects from it to yeah you know everything everything he's got in the hopper as well. So yeah, it's it was that was a really fun chat. 
Yeah, it was cool to hear him talk about the writer's room. And, and we found out, you know, a couple more things about that writer's room. Uh, uh, like uh, we I don't think we'd ever heard the name Chris Yost before. Uh, and he's a writer of comic books and he was a, a co-writer on uh, Thor Ragnarok, which we both obviously love. He was a he was a, a writer for The Mandalorian as well, the Disney Plus series. So I, that was a, a new name in the in the in the in the mix that we had not heard before that was in the writer's room. And also he said that Simon Pegg would call in a few times and join the discussion and, and talk about ideas and stuff, which I think we should talk about that more on this show about Simon Pegg and how he is a brilliant writer to himself. I mean, we love Shaun of the Dead and the work he's done with Edgar Wright, uh, the other movies that they've written together. And so Simon Pegg as a creative force in this franchise is, uh, you know, really interesting to think about that he was calling in for the writer's room as well. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that he he has taken more and more sort of like um, investment in the, these movies, whether it's even just saying like, yo, Macquarie, give me give me an arc or whatever. It's it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. But, you know, his instincts are great and he's a proven filmmaker himself. So, yeah, I really love this conversation. I thought he was he was great. And um, yeah, hearing about Beetlejuice 2 and Gremlins 2 and all that is it's fun as well. Hearing about any new movie that, that could have been made in a time when we aren't getting any new movies is fun, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little sad, though, that it seems like Beetlejuice 2 probably won't happen. I mean, maybe, uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's better to leave leave uh, well enough alone, maybe just leave the original. But I just think it could be kind of fun to have Keaton and, and Burton come back. Although now there, I guess there are like rumors of a Keaton... Burton Batman movie maybe at some point maybe they'll come return together I, I just I like the Keaton coming back for Dumbo I thought it was a, a fun performance that was in that movie yeah. that it was nice to see them re re uh, reteam that way uh, it was also yes. really cool to talk about Dark Shadows because I just uh, I think that movie is super weird and 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 is is, uh, is worth watching just for its absolute strangeness and also the gore it's just so gorgeous Bruno Delbanel's cinematography and and Rick Heinrichs' production design, as we talked about in, in his in his uh, interview here. So it's just really, uh, yeah, I, thought, I, I think it's a, a movie that's worth revisiting just for its oddballness. <laughs> yes, and a great uh, Michelle Pfeiffer performance, too. Fun to yeah. see her reteam with Burton. Yeah, we just want to remind everybody to, um, you know, sign up for the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash light the fuse. Uh, you know, you could just throw us a couple of bucks every month. And it would really help us out a lot. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in a good place, but we want to keep going and we want to keep growing and we want to keep doing more things for you guys. And hopefully we will. And we can't wait for quarantine to end so we can do some more things with physically with other people that we've been you know thinking about for a long time. So that would help us out a lot. Or if you want to buy a T-shirt at Public or like, subscribe, rate or review wherever you're listening to this podcast. Anything helps. Um, and we are very appreciative of any support that we get from you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. And and, and as always, there might be an announcement by now that the mission movies have, have started resumed shooting. If that's true, you know, you can count that uh, count on us talking about that in the Patreon bonus episodes. So sign up there if you want to hear us talk about that kind of stuff. Yes. And uh, thank you all so much for your support. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.